All right. Uh, one other little housekeeping note. We're going to do uh, something between our response song and our closing song. Um, I think you guys are all set with the video, but for the music team, we're just going to pause for a little bit, a little bit to have a minute or a couple minutes for LifeBridge, and we'll have a video. We weren't sure if anyone was going to be here this morning. It turned out sunny, so quite a few of us are. Uh, but obviously, a lot of us aren't here, so we may repeat it again. Uh, we'll see, but we'll pause between those two songs for it. Um, I, for years now, um, I've had, other than just my personal role as husband, father, neighbor, um, I've carried two roles that have been very significant for me. Uh, one of them is here as pastor. Um, the other role has been with a group up in Rochester uh, doing soccer things uh, as I've provided uh, leadership and some other uh, contacts for them. Um, and in those two worlds, okay, they're related in that almost everybody who's doing anything is a volunteer, okay? Um, I had a conversation with uh, Jackie Silly uh, years ago now who lives right across the street. She's pretty involved in politics. And uh, she stopped by and we just kind of conversed over things. And she ended up asking about uh, volunteers and how does that work and how do you motivate? And uh, I ended up sharing uh, that this good news with her that, well, I don't motivate um, we're already motivated because of what Christ has done for us. And anyway, uh, life in a volunteer world is different than life in an employee world, right? So you can picture that difference. If you're giving someone a paycheck, um, you can simply demand something of them. And it's, I need you here at 3 o'clock on Tuesday afternoon. I need this project done next week. And an employee is just automatically going to do it. But with volunteers, it's much softer, right? Hey, so I was thinking, 3 o'clock might be a, a good time, if you're free, to come, and maybe we can work together on this. And working with, with volunteers has been a delight. It's just been a lot different. But there's been a line for me um, that I've tried not to cross. And it doesn't mean it's a good line. I don't think it's necessarily a good thing. I haven't crossed it. But I've made that this line that I stopped short of begging, right? Because you can imagine there are things both in soccer as well as certainly in church that need to be done, are important to be done, have some sort of timely um, importance to them. And in that soft approach, I approach the line of, and you are gifted, you are called, God has given you. Hey, you're retired, you have freedom. And I stop right there as soon as someone says, I don't really know if that's for me. I tend to, to run away then, like, okay, fine. You know, we'll find someone else, God will provide something else. Because this line to me, stepping over it, means, I don't know, somehow, I'm not only... Pleading, it feels to me, and this is my pride, begging, and in that stance, my pride stops me from being humble enough to go over the line, no matter what it, it appears, to bring someone in to a place. Okay? It, you all kind of get the sense, and that's just a, a reality uh, of my life. Uh, and so we always need coaches, we always need board members. I want the vision, the reality of impacting kids in a city that needs healthy role models, connecting families uh, to move people around. I'll ask once. Maybe I'll ask twice if they'd be willing to coach. And then I tap out. Then I'm done. And so many of you give so much. Uh, literally, imagine for a moment, um, if volunteers at church decided not to do anything. We literally would have nothing. You guys and what you give behind the scenes in leadership up front is amazing to me. It's astounding. Literally, this place would be so boring without you. 
But if you resist, if you don't step forward, I don't really chase. Right? I'm, I'm not able or willing to get past my own pride to chase to draw someone in. And I don't know, it's probably, if I sat down with Sandy or a counselor or a psychologist, it's probably deep layers in me from the a playground at New Searles Elementary School that I needed to be important. And uh, so here's my life as an elementary school kid. I remember clearly a New Searles playground of uh, being out watching all the kids play kickball, and I was playing too. And I had the thought cross my mind, and this is morbid. I thought as a little fourth or fifth grader, huh, if I died right now, how many of these kids would even come to my funeral? And uh, I, that might be more normal the older you get. Maybe some of you have had that kind of thought. But as a little kid, I thought, yeah, that's normal for me. All of it was, I want to be important. I want people to like me. I want um, myself elevated. And it, it probably goes back to that kind of scenario. And this is one area of my life with others that I sure don't look like Jesus. Jesus pursues. Jesus chases down, giving each one of us so many second chances, even in the offer of salvation. So last week we spent some time looking at Jesus saving the wayward, uh, meaning those of us who make Choices that are really detrimental, that are uh, really obviously sinful, and we're chasing life, and Jesus comes and saves us out of those. And some of us have those stories. And this week, we get an opportunity to look at the truth that Jesus saves the reluctant. Those who are not interested, the disinterested. And I know that some of your stories. Stubborn. How many of you would describe yourselves as stubborn? Okay. How many of you would describe your spouse as stubborn? Yeah, Yeah, see? How many of us are truthful, right? That's kind of where that goes. Um, Stubbornness is something that uh, maybe everywhere, certainly New England, uh, we actually weirdly take pride in that stubbornness. And uh, we have all sorts of names, all sor- sorts of phrases for it. But a lot of us have that, that trait. And, it, and this is how stubborn goes. It's like a friend, a spouse, a family member comes along and says, hey, it looks like you're stuck in a rut. Whatever that rut is. Yeah, this is my rut. Leave me alone. Yeah, but do you know that rut? is running off the cliff. I don't want you going off that cliff. Well, who are you to tell me where my rut goes? I don't care. In fact, you're pretty annoying now. I'm done. (laughs) Stubbornness, it's a trait a lot of us have. And in Acts chapter 9, if you want to work your way there, we get the opportunity to see the power of of the forgiveness of God, takes what is shameful, removes it, and replaces it with the delight of God. And God saves certainly among those of us who are wayward, but God also saves among those of us who were uninterested, even reluctant. So, if you had to pick, if you've been in church for any amount of time, If you had to identify biblically a brother who was uninterested in anything that had to do with Christianity, you, like me, would probably quickly go to Saul, who we know as Paul, right? I don't think we can find uh, a biblical character more opposed, more stubborn, more um, intent not only on ignoring Christianity, but engaging it to destroy Christianity. And so Saul's mission in life was to crush what people of that day called the way, uh, Christianity, 
Because Saul saw it as a new sect of Judaism. That there's one true religion in the world, and it came from God. There's one God and one faith, and these people over here are changing it, morphing it. They're creating a cult, and I need to stamp it down. He believed uh, Christianity was a blasphemous distortion of his one true religion. So his goal was to just extinguish it all. And so Saul had gone to the authorities of his day. He had gotten paperwork allowing him to imprison, beat, torture, kill anyone who confessed that Jesus is Lord. Which meant women, men, children. It didn't matter. Saul was not on a personal mission. He was on a mission from his authorities. He had power to do what he intended to do. And on his way to Damascus, with papers in his hand to continue the oppression, Jesus literally knocks him off his horse. So, Acts chapter 9, beginning in verse 1. Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest, and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus, so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. I mean, even back in Saul's day, it would have been interesting to track it, but word still traveled without Twitter. And somehow, word is moving from Jerusalem out to Syria, uh, which is north of Israel, to the city of Damascus. Word is traveling, even as Saul is traveling, and it's reaching the believing community in Damascus. And so if you're a follower of the way, if you've declared Jesus as Lord, you've been baptized, you know this uh, fellow Saul is coming with the papers. You know he's committed uh, not only to opposing, but he's committed to crushing your community. And he's coming to your church. And on the way, something happens that changes history. Verse 3. As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, he replied. Now get up and go into the city and you will be told what you must do. The men traveling with Saul stood there speechless. They heard the sound, but did not see anyone. Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand into Damascus. For three days he was blind and did not eat or drink anything. And Jesus asks Saul this question, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And I just find it fascinating that as Jesus is looking at his church, the the question we would think is, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting my people? Or Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting my church? Right? But somehow Jesus doesn't make any distinction between he and his church. That the church is his body. Which I find really fascinating in that Jesus can look at FCCB and identify with us so much that he can swap pronouns around. It's me, it's you, it's him, it's us. Because we're united with Christ in this divine kind of way. That's stunning because of the grace of God. And so he asked Saul, why are you persecuting me? To which uh, Paul answers with a question of his own. Who are you? Uh, you? Why am I persecuting you? I don't even know you. Who are you, Lord? He asks. And then Jesus doubles down with his identity with his church. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. 
As much as I find it striking that Jesus identifies so closely with his church, that he's wound up so much with his people, with us, I find it equally striking that this fellow Paul, who's coming to strike down and crush the church in Damascus, I find it striking that Paul never answers the question, why? Because even those who are opposed and uninterested in things of faith, even an enemy of Jesus, I believe, when confronted by the truth in the presence of Jesus, recognizes that there's a greater need to know him than there is to justify my actions. And that's what Saul is in. He's in this moment of the risen Lord is present with him. And he's given the opportunity to justify what he's doing. And instead he recognizes the need. I need to know. I need to know who you are. And the story finishes up with the Lord appearing to uh, Ananias, which I love him. Uh, God's like, I want you. He's like, I don't want to do this. And God's like, no, you're going to be the man. You're going to receive Saul. So the rest of the chapter, beginning in verse 10. In Damascus, there's a disciple named Ananias. The Lord called to him in a vision, Ananias. Uh, some of you have shared stories over the years about the Lord uh, just giving you a word, a vision that lines up with Scripture, and uh, it's a, a verified communication from the Lord. And we as a church uh, embrace that as long as uh, we can verify that, yes, what God is giving to you in your vision, your dream, uh is in line with the Holy Word, then we'll interact with it. Um, And you probably, if that's you, recognize the feeling Ananias had at that moment. Oh no. He's giving me another message. Because it's not like the Lord tends to give you happy, cheery messages, right? They're difficult. It's a word of truth to be spoken. It's a risky step to be taken. And Ananias is about to get that. From Jesus. Yes, Lord, he answered. And the Lord told him, Go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he's praying. We're just going to keep rolling through this with this one note. I don't know what your view of God is in terms of is he distant? Is he present? Does he care? Does he maybe set things in motion um, and kind of check out and let uh, the physical laws just happen and life just happen? He's literally paying attention to a particular house on a particular street in a particular city. Meaning, the details of our life are very visible to God. God knows not only the number of hairs on your head. He could, if he chose to, send you a piece of mail to your address. He loves you. He knows you. And he's sending Ananias to this particular house on a particular street named Straight Street. In a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. Lord, Ananias answered, I've heard many reports about this man and all the harm he's done to your saints in Jerusalem. And he has come here with authority from the chief priests to arrest all who call on your name. Like Ananias has heard it correctly, he's absolutely summarizing exactly what's going on. But the Lord said to Ananias, Go. Go. Yeah, you got that right, Ananias. Right summary. And I want you to go. This man is my chosen instrument to carry my name before the Gentiles and their kings and before the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. Then Ananias went to the house and entered it. Placing his hands on Saul, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord, Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here, 
has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately, something like scales fell from Saul's eyes, and he could see again. He got up and was baptized, and after taking some food, he regained his strength. Now, this was a brother who had absolutely no interest in following Jesus. Completely uninterested. In fact, Saul was someone, he didn't even have a nearby Christian neighbor or co-worker who was praying with him and over time sharing homemade goodies uh, in order to break down the barriers to share. He didn't have any of that to break up his fallow hard ground. He didn't. He's completely uninterested. No one's explaining the necessity of Jesus' death and resurrection for the salvation of the world to Saul. In fact, Saul would be the one that would explain it all to the rest of us. Inspired by the Holy Spirit, he would end up writing about 70% of the New Testament. The Lord just showed up in the middle of his disinterest and just kind of blew his heart up in a new dramatic way. Blew him up with the truth of his presence. And there's good news in this for us. If Jesus can and did offer salvation and save Saul, we can, with any level of logic and biblical truth, say, there's hope for my kids. There's hope for my neighbor, for my brother, for my friend, who has been not only disinterested in Christianity and things of faith, but maybe even actively opposed. We went through four weeks in Advent that you brought up uh, cards with mainly prayer requests, some scripture, some words of encouragement, but primarily prayer requests that you laid in the manger we had set up. And so many of you guys, you have people that you love dearly that don't know about the Lordship of Jesus. Or maybe know of it and have rejected it. And some of you in those and in other conversations that we've had together, some of you have actually been told by these people you love I do not want you sharing anything about Jesus with me. And it's breaking your heart. It's breaking your spirits. And so maybe you've tried all the back channels, right? I know you've done this. Leave your Bible strategically open on the table so that maybe they can read it. Or maybe uh, have you ever had a pretend phone conversation? You know, like, oh, yeah, hold on, I'll, I'll be... No, no, Jesus loves you. He, he, he'll he forgive that, too. And in any way that you've had the opportunity, you've taken anything to try to manipulate someone to accept the gospel. And here's the hard thing. After one year, five years, ten years, your spirits have tanked. And we now see this person differently. And maybe it's been a long time since we've been to our knees in prayer again. And we've just lost heart and we've stopped pleading with the Lord to save them. Or, I don't know, maybe we default into some theological space and kind of put fractures of truth together in verses to, to just justify what's going on over there Maybe to find some solace in, or maybe some of us have resigned ourselves that they just simply are outside the scope of salvation. And here's the gut-wrenching part for us guys. We believe because it's true in the eternal destinies of men and women. And so we believe in a literal hell in a literal heaven for all of eternity. And it it just drives that even deeper into our hearts when we think about those 
in our lives who are opposed to the gospel because eternally is a forever thing. And we know that's a big deal and we struggle with it. And so here's our good news. The good news is not just that God saves the reluctant and the uninterested and the wayward, but that your Father is the only Father ever who has invited us to pester Him, to come and ask again, to bother Him in His throne room, to keep asking and to not stop asking. Have you ever told your kids that? No. (laughs) Right? Like, how would that go? You know what? This is the 35th time that you've asked me the same question. You know what I can't wait for? It's number 36. I can't wait till we get to 136. I just want you to know, son, I want you to keep coming back and asking and asking and asking, which is exactly what our Heavenly Father invites us to do. Flip with me, if you would, to Luke chapter 18. It's only a couple books before uh, Acts. Luke chapter 18. Jesus tells a, a story that has this as its main point. Luke 18, verse 1. Then Jesus told his disciples a parable to show them I don't know exactly what version you're reading. Mine says to show them that they should always pray and never give up. Do you have someone like Saul in your life? Maybe a toned down version of Saul in your life? Someone who's opposed, someone who's put up barriers, someone who maybe has pushed you aside because of your faith but you love them and you want them to know the good news of Jesus. And listen to this parable, because Jesus wants to show us that we should always pray and not give up. He said, In a certain town there is a judge who neither feared God nor cared about men. And there is a widow in that town who kept coming to him with the plea, Grant me justice against my adversary. For some time, he refused. But finally, he said to himself, you know, even though I don't fear God or care about men, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will see that she gets justice so that she won't eventually wear me out with her coming. And the Lord said, listen to what the unjust judge says. And will not God bring about justice for his chosen ones who cry out to him day and night? Will he keep putting them off? I tell you, He will see that they get justice and quickly. However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? We're going to do something, and maybe it's okay that we're a little more intimate, a little smaller numbers this morning. We're going to do something a bit different. If you're here, and there are people that you dearly love in your life, who are not interested in Jesus Christ at all, and they have no desire to know, to love, to experience the grace of Jesus that you've experienced. It could be a son or daughter who once walked with the Lord and now isn't, maybe never did. It could be a brother. For some of you, it might be a sister, or a mom, or a dad, or a neighbor who's been resistant for like 13 years. We're going to spend some time this morning together praying. We're going to pray again. And maybe this will be the first time in months or years that you're going to come back to the throne with your request because you're not their Savior. Nor am I. We can't manipulate them into salvation, but we do have this awesome opportunity, right? We get to pray for their salvation. Because Jesus is their Savior, we're not. So we're going to ask the Lord 
whose arm is not too short to save, and whose ear is not too deaf to hear, we're going to pray for Jesus to save. And we're going to believe together, however hardened, however rebellious, however opposed that your person or your people are, that they are not too far from the Lord that He cannot save them. And some of you, I don't know, you might be thinking, yeah, but what if God doesn't? That's not for us! (laughs) Us is to listen to God's Word and we're instructed to come and pray. And so we're going to come and pray in faith. Okay? We're a congregational church, which means uh, we don't really move much. We try to stay still in our pews. But we're going to move a little bit. Um, I'm going to invite you. Um, I will pray, but I would love to have some of you pray. And uh, you can use your discernment on what that uh, sounds like in terms of how you want to pray. But I also want to invite you, if you are um, in that group of folks that you have that person, you have that Saul, you have that one who's completely uninterested, but you love them. I want to invite you to stand. Um, and if some of you would like to offer a prayer, to do so verbally. Uh, but I will also collectively pray for us. So would you mind doing that? Could you stand, if you have someone in your life, that you want the community of faith uh, to pray that God would come and rescue and stop their disinterest, and generate a new life and a new heart. Would you stand um, with us? (laughs) All right. So I'm going to start our prayer, and then I'm going to leave it open. If you would like to pray, whether it's general or specific, um, if you feel the courage to do that, if you could pray out, and then I'll close us. Uh, in a few moments. Father, we come before your throne with no sense of worthiness on our own. But God, we carry this testimony, we carry this story in our lives that we were wayward, we were uninterested. And your gospel came and knocked us off our horse. And we carry this great hope, Lord Jesus, that you can and that you will do the same for those in our lives who we see are uninterested and opposed to you. Because you've told us your arm is not too short, because you've told us your ears are not deaf, we come in prayer, God, in faith, that you will do what only you can do in those hearts. God, may you restore a vibrancy in our prayer life for those outside of your family. God, may you restore hope deep in our souls that the gospel goes into every nook and cranny of this world, including their lives. God, we lift these faces, these individuals. God, I pray for my sister-in-law that you would stir in her heart the joy that once was there. 